right, there we go. Hey everyone, Richard Carlton here. Welcome to another great day of FileMaker training at fmtraining.tv. I'm the creator of fmtraining.tv where you can learn all about the FileMaker platform and learn how to build better FileMaker applications for you, your customers, your organization. This broadcast is completely free to everyone and is being broadcast in high definition to Discord, YouTube, and to Twitch. This broadcast is being recorded, which is really great. Of course, we might clean up the recording a little bit. So if we make a malfunction during the live stream, then of course we reserve the right to clean that up on the recording later on. However, because it's a live broadcast, we encourage you to ask questions. In fact, some people get aggravated when there's this dialogue with you and we ask questions. I, I, we want questions. If you have a question, odds are other people have the question too. And so I want to thank everyone for logging in, Ken and TK and Dave, Dave One, Dave Learning, uh, Ed, uh, Elzo, uh, Carol, Jake, Mike, all of you, welcome once again to another great broadcast. Now, as a reminder, if you want to check out the upcoming broadcast, go to fmtraining.tv, press the left tab for the live button, you can see the upcoming broadcast schedule. That's pretty awesome. Additionally, if you want to help support this channel, right? We always say this, uh, this broadcast is brought to you by fmtraining.tv, bringing you the greatest and the most entertaining FileMaker training videos available. So the idea is that if you want to help support the channel, make sure you check out our on-demand video bundles. We have videos that cover the latest version of FileMaker. We have videos that cover the deploy course. In fact, we used to sell the courses individually anymore. It's just much simpler to sell a complete bundle for a low price. We do this on an annual basis. So if you buy one of the bundles, that really helps support the channel. It ensures that we can keep coming back every day because this broadcast actually takes a lot of money to run. The people here don't work for free. Hi everyone, I'm Richard Carlton, creator of fmtrain.tv. Welcome from Broadcast Studios here. Uh, on the West Coast of the United States, we are broadcasting multiple streams in parallel. Things are really quite out of hand, I might admit. I, this is uh, the most elaborate thing I've ever done. So I'm surrounded by four or five computers and they're all broadcasting on various things. So this is fmtrain.tv. For those of you who are wondering what we do every day, we're providing great FileMaker training on the FileMaker platform. Uh, and so we're excited to have another awesome day today. So today's broadcast engineer is Miles Debsky from the Portland area. Welcome, Miles. Hey. Uh, he's there. And then we got uh, Jacob Taylor who's gonna be talking to us about kind of the idea of uh, if you've been on a really old version of FileMaker, which some of you are on like really old, and when I say really old, I mean like, you know, 15 and before 15, right? And it might seem like not very far back, but the, in dog years, if you have FileMaker 15, that's like a 10 or 12 year old dog, okay? And if you have FileMaker 5, uh, the dog is dead, right? And But no one's bought, you're still petting it. It's a dead dog, kind of morbid, but uh, someone knows someone should notify you that uh, uh, Fido rough uh, the dog is Fido the dog is no longer with us you're still petting him because it's cool right so uh, the idea is to be petting a dog that's alive that's healthy that's breathing that's eating food right um, kind of a <laughs> kind of a sick thing but the reality it's a very true statement right because I have people out there like we got FileMaker 4 and it's been working for 30 years and now we're going to upgrade it it's like uh, there's no path for that there's no reasonable path that you're going to want to pay for, right? The problem is you might have a dead dog or dead animal in your in your FileMaker system, and it's so old. Uh, I mean, let's, under, let's understand that it's it's so old because it worked for you, which was awesome, and but because you didn't reinvest, you saved all this money, but now you get to the end, and you're going to have to put a chunk of change in there to get this uh, fixed. Jacob Taylor, I'm going to transfer command of the ship to you. I'm going to leave the bridge. You have the con. Yes? Awesome. Yep. So um, today, what we're going to cover is uh, I, I I think Richard changed my verbiage here, which is fine. But uh, long distance FileMaker upgrades. This is like you know you're on version uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, something like that. Um, you haven't invested in FileMaker maybe significantly in a few years now, um, and you're looking at all right, uh, you know 18, 19's out, ooh, or maybe 
going to think about 20 um, showing up at some point. And so what what kind of considerations does that bring in? So you have a working solution. Like if you're coming to us and saying, hey, we need to do this big upgrade, like it's time. And, you know, it's been how many years? Um, and so we're, I'm going to walk through. I, I have kind of a bulleted list on my end. Um, and I'm hopefully if I miss something, Miles, or I'm sure somebody in Discord will uh, pick it up. But um, basically, I want to kind of take on this topic. A <laughs> I was joking to Miles earlier about this, a little bit like an onion, um, because you want to start basically on the outside and then work your way inwards. And the outside in this case is uh, actually like hardware considerations. Um, so one of the big, I mean, you guys know, uh, technology keeps changing, computers get faster and faster and faster. Uh, you know, old old computers are gonna have certain kinds of hard drives like slower spinning disks. Uh, if you buy a new one these days, I think maybe the bottom bin ones don't come with SSDs yet, but uh, but if you spend just a little bit extra, you can get that and you, it'll be worth it over the, over the life of the machine. Um, and so we'll start out talking about hardware um, there's two components to hardware. One is your FileMaker server. The other is uh, any clients. And I'm just going to say that broadly. That'll be anything that'll run FileMaker Pro, FileMaker Go, um, also WebDirect if you're uh, either intending to use it. That one will kind of depend on what version you're coming from, um, realistically. Uh, but uh, but the yeah, but the main stuff will be like FileMaker Pro and FileMaker Go. So Pro has certain hardware and software requirements. Um, Go has uh, basically minimum operating system versions at this point. So uh, iPad or I, uh, either the iPad OS or the I, uh, like iPhone iOS, um, both of those at least currently like the minimum version is 13.2, um, but it runs on very old hardware. So you'll have to figure out kind of if you have iPads in the field or something like that, um, what what physical, sorry, I'm like, you can't see me, I'm holding my hardware here. I'm holding my iPad um, that I don't own. Uh, <laughs> um, so you'll have to figure out what uh, versions of iOS that they are compatible with. Um, and then either get them upgraded or if you know if it's too old then you have to go buy new hardware or something like that. Um, same thing for anything that will run pro. Um, you want to make sure that those uh, I mean for some very simple solutions the hardware may not matter too much um, especially if you know basically you use FMSP and if you haven't done a whole huge amount with it uh, you can probably get away with not that nice of a computer but um, but because it is a custom application if you're doing anything interesting with it you do want to think about this as something a little above just a peon computer at the business um, we we do recommend spending a little bit of money on your FileMaker Pro machines you don't have to go buy the the most awesome developer machine that everybody's ever seen um, that's that's not unless you're the developer, maybe then you, you do that. But um, but just for most users, it's not strictly required. Um, but also at this point, if you're not buying a computer with like eight plus gigs of RAM, uh, you know, and maybe an SSD, I would recommend one. But, you know, some people will say, well, we can save 10 bucks or whatever. Um, then, yeah, you're, you, you may have issues. You may have performance problems. FileMaker isn't super heavy on RAM or anything else. Um, but if you go into list views with tons of records, you know, that kind of stuff, or if you do big processes that are going to churn through a bunch of records, um, memory helps. Just memory helps, hard, hard disk. Uh, it actually, for, so for FileMaker Pro particularly, it didn't used to matter as much um, what hard drive you had, um, but... And this is why we're talking about long distance. So it's kind of the aggregate of changes that have happened over time. So uh, FileMaker Pro, like in the early version of this time range that we're talking about, which is like pre-12, um, it had caches. It would have a RAM cache. It would have a disk cache uh, for records. It, throw, it used to throw them away. It keeps them now. So if it's keeping them, then it has to go check them next time it sees something that might have that record on it. Uh, that's going to be sped up by a faster hard drive because then it can check it more quickly. Um, in most cases, still the network is going to be the limiting factor there. But uh, you know, if you can save yourself some some pauses and stuff like that, that'll be good. Um, so after kind of basic hardware considerations, which is kind of compatibility, um, if you're doing a big jump like this, probably you'll buy all new stuff or something like it. Um, 
for for smaller upgrades for smaller number of versions upgrades um, sometimes you can find like a middle version to jump through so for example I have a few clients who are on 16 still um, and they're gonna go to 19 and they can't they can't realistically bridge that gap um, and they're also not a business who can afford to just write a check to upgrade all of those computers simultaneously um, so as it turns out what they'll be able to do is uh, we'll put the server on 19 we'll put FileMaker Pro, uh, which is all that they use in this case. Um, we'll put FileMaker Pro on 18, which will talk to a 19 server. Um, and then as they go forward with new, I think this co the company I'm thinking of is getting Max, um, they're just going to replace them. And so the, the brand new shiny ones will get 19 with the 19 server and be, you know, rocket rocket ships and jet engines and whatever and, and do great um, and the people that are on the older hardware will just do 19 which is a nice or we'll do 18 sorry which is a nice bridge version um, but if you're coming up from like older than that if you're 15 14 13 there's not going to be like a bridge version that you can go between and so it's going to be like you're you're going to end up buying new hardware you're going to end up buying new software um, and it's probably going to be a giant all at once everybody gets flipped over you know friday to monday type thing um, Monday morning, everybody comes in and everything's fresh. So then we'll we'll jump in. So I, I have like a, a bulleted list, and these sections are going to get longer. Hardware is basically like I have, you know you have to look up what the minimum requirements are for 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 FileMaker Pro or server or Go or that kind of stuff. Um, I guess I can talk about the basics, which is uh, any FileMaker server we recommend that they have eight gigs of RAM, um, an SSD, a dual core anything better than that on all axes is great. Um, we do build systems with four gigs of RAM, uh, but as has been, <laughs> as we've covered previously on these live streams, basically Richard is nervous about that. But you wanna look at like how many people are gonna be on it. So if you have a FileMaker server and you're only gonna have five people, uh, you know, you can get away with small amounts of RAM, a little dual core, maybe even not that fast of a dual core. Um, this is kind of in the the old, you know, you, you some of our on-site and, and uh, you know less flush with cash uh, clients will go find an old Mac Mini and, and do some hosting on site and stuff like that. Um, and that works great for them, especially if you don't have that much data, you don't have that many users, you're not you know beating the heck out of your database 24/7. You know it's fine basically. Um, you, you won't use all the the kind of features and horsepower and cool stuff in the platform, but like if your business isn't you know <laughs> that complicated, then uh, it may not matter so much. Um, however, if you have more interesting requirements, if you have a bunch of, you're, you're using plugins, you have lots of scheduled scripts, you have a large data set, you uh, have either lots of users or enough that, you know, it's a challenge in some cases, um, you're gonna have elevated har hardware requirements on that. And so you wanna be thinking about a quad core or better on that server, you're gonna be adding more RAM, it's not gonna be, you know, four and probably it'll be eight, eight, eight at least definitely um, and probably 16 32 somewhere somewhere in there most of the I've had I've had a I've had one request for like a 64 gig virtual machine um, 64 gigs of RAM but most of ours are in the 16 to 32 range um, we don't usually deal with um, systems that are over a hundred concurrence at a time um, and so uh, actually the RAM requirements and stuff like that will probably go up in those cases um, just to smooth out the cache pretty much um, that would be an interesting project anyway um, so, uh, but that, that kind of stuff aside, so after hardware considerations, we have to talk about, all right, what's the next layer of the onion? Well, within the computer is the operating system. So what does compatibility look like for that? So um, as I mentioned, if you're, if you're doing like, uh, you know, FileMaker 15 to 19, uh, there's not much overlap. Actually, I don't think there's any on the server. I don't think 15 runs on FileMaker Server 15, does that, I don't think that runs on uh, Windows Server 2016. Um, and that's, a, Windows actually is the only side where there's any like overlap with the versions where it's like more than a couple. Um, for example, because you could go, you can go back and get like, uh, you can go from 16 to 18 or 19 keeping the same, um, keeping the same server machine, but 15 and earlier, it's, it, there's just, there's no compatible operating system between the two. So you, you're going to end up with something fresh, basically. Um, a to either a totally new machine, a totally new virtual machine, if that's how you're doing it, um, that kind of thing. Um, 
as far as Windows goes, so probably you're going to be doing Windows Server 2016 or 2019. Um, I have a personal preference for 2019. Uh, they're basically the same, and actually 2016 uses a little less RAM, um, but just looking at it from a support perspective, uh, 2019 comes later, thus we'll have at least probably several additional years of support from Microsoft. Um, but similar considerations for any Macs that you, if you're a Mac shop. So uh, you'll be on Mojave or newer if you're going to 19 um, for either the server or pro, um, just kind of the, the supported versions are uh, close, basically. Um, they, they somewhat match between pro and, and server. Um, and so <laughs> like the farthest kind of thread that you can, you know, needle that you can thread with this is uh, if you came up and, you know, you could get, you have an old Mac, for example, and you can get it up to High Sierra. Okay. So High Sierra can run FileMaker Pro 18, which will give you a bridge version, um, which is like a, you have like a stepping stone. So you'll have whatever the old version is. You have an intermediate version for, for old computers that can't be replaced at the time. That's what I mean by a bridge version, um, where you have to make the software comply to the requirements rather than the other way around, where you just say, well, we'll throw it out and get new Macs or, or whatever. Um, but depending on the size of your business, that may be a check that you're not interested in writing, or it may be a check that you're not interested in writing at one time. Um, you know, every you know every, every other month you buy a new Mac or something like that, That's a, that can be a, um, a little more diligent, especially if you don't have that many computers. Um, so... Uh, and then, so that's that kind of covers server. Um, the oldest anything that's supported right now on server is Windows Server 2012 R2. I would generally avoid that, to be honest. Um, any systems that you have that are of that version, I would be working to replace them um, at this point. So um, for Pro, uh, it's a little it's a little simpler. Basically, um, if you're on 17 or if you're on 18 you can do windows 7 8.1 or 10 i think filemaker pro only does 10 it may also do 8.1 i should have re reviewed that i didn't double check that but um but basically you're going to end up on 10 um, windows 10 or uh, if you're on os x you'll be on again same uh, mojave or newer which is 10.14 um and if you're, uh, by the way, if you have computers that are going to be running FileMaker Pro 19, um, and they your Macs are on Big Sur, which is the very latest version that's out, um, you know, if you're fully up to date, basically, um, you're going to want to have a, a a very recent version of 19. Um, there are issues between FileMaker and OS X that are fixed um, post FileMaker Pro 19.1 if I remember the numbers um, from Claris's document correctly. So um, generally you're gonna be on FileMaker Pro 19.2 anyway if you're installing 19 because you'll just go to the latest version um, and that, that is what we would recommend at this time. Um, but just be aware of that basically. If you, um, One of the ways you can run into this is if you have 18 on your computer, you upgrade to Big Sur and then it doesn't work or you know FileMaker crashes or this kind of stuff. Um, and so you'll be upgrading at that time basically. Let's see. Um, got some questions in Discord. All right, so we'll pause for a second and address those. Uh, what is more, that's a good question from David Angel. What is more important for a server, a fast CPU, hard disk, or RAM? Uh, I mean, if I want to do an upgrade for better performance. So assuming that your CPU isn't slow and you have at least, I'll say the minimum amount, uh, which would be a dual core for small numbers of users and probably a quad core or better um, for larger numbers. Uh, you want a faster hard drive and more RAM. Um, if you have a very slow CPU, fix that first, basically. Um, but realistically, you're gonna, uh, uh, most of our customers would benefit from more RAM. Um, most of our customers would benefit, if they're not already there, from having an SSD. Um, if the hardware is new enough to support an NVMe SSD, uh, that is what I would recommend. Um, with on-site servers, for example, you can kind of do mix and match. So if you wanted, uh, you know, a big RAID array for your backups and stuff, and then you have one you know, lowly NVMe drive that stores your database. Um, I would say that's an excellent combination for performance because you'll have excellent um, 
you know, backup reliability from a, from a big rate array or something like that. Um, and then you'll have absolutely blistering speed on the database itself um, because you'll put that on the NVMe drive. So, um, but, and then other, uh, and then other than that, the other main recommendation that we make is RAM because people try and under, uh, under spec on RAM and just don't, you're in memory cache, uh, Will, will perform much better if you have one, basically. Um, because if you're under-resourcing your server on, mem on, on RAM, on memory, um, you, you won't be able to, at least you won't be able to turn up the in-memory cache. And so if you only have a very baby, tiny, you know, your database is 300 megabytes or something, probably the default settings will work for you, actually. Um, but if you have a large data set, you need more in-memory cache. Um, that's going to make your users a lot happier. It will make your application perform much more quickly um, under all scenarios, basically, without qualification. So um, that's just something to keep an eye on. Yep, fast SSD, then RAM. And then last, yeah, realistically above a certain, uh, under a certain amount, you'll want to address the CPU, but yeah, CPU is basically last as far as hardware concerns go. Mm -mm -mm. Scrolling up, uh, asking if FMS 19.2 uses multi-core processor. Uh, yes, kind of, but not the way that you think. Um, so, that's a, there's a couple parts to answering uh, kind of the multi-core question on server. Because um, uh, for a lot of software these days, um, if, if, they're, if they really can take advantage of multiple cores, they'll do multi-threading, they'll have some sort of con concurrency or parallel computation um, built into it. And um, FileMaker Server has some of that, uh, and some of that's in fact new, but mostly it doesn't take advantage of that. So the one of the one of the things to be aware of is like at least historically, um, not I say fewer cores. Like if you're talking about modern hardware, you can go get one of those AMD behemoths that's got like 32 processors or something in it. Um, so those won't be taken advantage of as effectively by FileMaker Server. They're amazing, just to be clear. But um, but you would probably get more actual juice out of it if you had better single core performance rather than um, lots and lots of cores to throw at the problem. Uh, I guess the only reason, the only time that that's not strictly true um, is, what is it? One of the other consultancies figured out how to host uh, FileMaker server in Docker. And then, um, and then FileMaker server at that point is not responsible for being multi-core. Um, the Docker container is, uh, and that that will do those multi-cores. You know, like a, one of those big chunky AMDs, um, the, the Epics or something like that. Uh, that will better take advantage of that hardware. Um, but only that one company, as far as I know, does that. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't base my advice on that. Um, in general. Uh, you're going to get better performance with FileMaker Server with, uh, you know, I don't know, say fewer cores, like, you know, you're trying to reduce the number. Um, but if you have a really fast quad core versus a little slower six or eight core, you're probably going to do better with the quad core. Um, however, uh, and I did want to note this. So some changes that came in FileMaker Server 19.2, I think it's, it might have been one when they first introduced the change. Don't quote me on that. Sorry. Um, but 19, we'll just say, uh, it's probably 19.1 actually. Um, so uh, you guys have heard about some of the performance stuff that they've done on the server side where um, you can have multiple finds running uh, at the same time. And basically if if the finds don't use the exact same key fields, uh, they can run, sim they can, not simultaneously, concurrently, I guess, at the same time. Um, and so that will, that actually does, yeah, use potentially multiple cores um, and take advantage of that. Uh, but it's it's like, you know, one or two features. I think they're moving in that direction generally. Um, I think that's the, the eventual intention is to have the parts of FileMaker server that can spread across multiple cores and be sped up uh, will do so over time. I think that's, I think that's specifically a performance focus of theirs. Um, but like I said, it's, you know, there's only a few things in the software that do that currently. So let's see, I think I technically an answered Kyle Williams' question, uh, but not intentionally, which is he was asking about the older versions, which really don't use the extra cores. So one, one thing, 
how do you say that? So the other part is you still want something like a quad core for most for most situations greater than about 10 people. Um, the reason for that though is actually not because the FileMaker server process will go across the extra cores that you throw at that problem necessarily. Um, uh, what it will let you do is when you do perform script on server or you have scheduled scripts or something like that, your um, your 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 FM SASE process, which is what runs all of those things on the server, that thing does actually it'll eat more than a core. And so if you're doing server side stuff, um, either you know you have users that click buttons in your solution and that does a piece off and then returns with something or whatever, those will go faster. Um, because they're more able to spread across the cores. Uh, it, but it is basically historically true that you know each individual process in FileMaker could use one core, but they weren't they're not frankly, they're not really capable of using kind of effectively. there's like I said, there's little parts of it that do, but not really. Um, not as a general a general rule like where I can just say, oh yeah, filemaker servers multi-core like you know if you throw 32 cores at it, it'll just, if you give it some really chunky record finds or whatever, it'll just and sit down and do it. Um, it's it's unfortunately it's not like that. Um, like I said, I think they're working in that direction, but we're not there yet. So, um, do, 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 do. some commentary about Linux support changes. Um, Yep, some commentary about Linux support changes. I think I mentioned that previously. So uh, they deprecated and killed. Uh, it's not like gone from the download page, but but support basically, I don't know if it's ended, but uh, they're not going to continue making it. Um, so we're moving from CentOS Linux to Ubuntu. Um, the Ubuntu version of FileMaker Server is not yet out to the public. Um, it is available in their testing program, basically. So um, once that is the case, um, I will probably, unless that thing uh, bakes my bread for me, I we will probably wait until the next uh, release for Ubuntu is cut before we begin recommending it, just like we did that when the CentOS server version came out. Um, as a, a, Every time, the first time they put something out, there will be sharp edges that people find, um, and they'll fix them for the second version. So I'm not really worried about it. It just means that if you're not willing to, uh, you know, if you're not willing to fight with a potentially imperfect installation of the software, uh, you know, we just, we don't recommend it basically. So it'll be, the alternatives are easier, which is just either use a Windows one, use a Mac uh, or wait. So um, do, 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 do. we had a question from YouTube. Um, is it true that one server can only support a maximum of a hundred concurrent web direct connections? Uh, yes, I believe that is the certified number. Um, so if you do, it's it's there's a little bit of nuance to that question though. So uh, if you do a single server installation, which means FileMaker server, WebDirect, all the accoutrements, everything's on one machine. Uh, generally, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, it actually will do more. We did that. Um, was that in 2018, Miles? Maybe or 2019 when we did the melting FileMaker oh, no. cloud. Yeah. Uh, event i don't remember <laughs> it's been, it's been a little while now a um, but, since but then, yeah <laughs> yeah but um we we pushed that thing that was that was the biggest machine that filemaker cloud for aws would let us buy uh and we pushed it over 180 web directs at a time um web direct connections at a time so um you know the the stated tested limitations versus what you can actually achieve can sometimes be different um but but past a certain point, realistically, you're just throwing more hardware at the problem. Uh, the second, the part of the, the nuance that goes with that is if you set up WebDirect worker machines, um, which are uh, kind of server front ends, they're like a, a front end, it's not even a caching server, that's a bad analogy. Uh, at, just like multiple machines that people can connect to for WebDirect, you could have 100 per each of those, which I believe you can set five of those up as the limit, so you can have up to 500 um, people connected to WebDirect. Basically, it does like a big round robin between them. So you give you have people. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go log onto my database and you know click into WebDirect or whatever. Um, and so the server is gonna pick one of those uh, WebDirect workers that is lightly loaded and send you there. Um, and then that that'll be where that'll be where you're talking to the database from. Um, so let's see, CentOS is being, yep, that's true. CentOS is being deprecated in f favor of Ubuntu. Uh, the only 
downside actually right now is that the version of Ubuntu that they're aiming to um, support is uh, 18.04 instead of 20, which is this year's um, uh, long-term support release, or last year's, I guess, 2021, man. <laughs> um, so hopefully they'll get that updated, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll wait to see what they put out or when they, if they're going to stick with 18 and then go for go for 20. But um, anyway, so uh, after the questions, uh, we'll go back to uh, long distance FileMaker upgrade considerations. So, um, do, 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 do. All right, so we talked about server. So we, we did hardware, we did operating systems, um, qu questions on support for either server or pro. Uh, in general, I'm basically not gonna touch Go today because uh, you should go look, well, uh, basically you should go look at the chart that Claris has because that's the answer for any Go upgrade questions that you have. Uh, they have lists of supported operating system versions and they have lists of supported hardware um, for those operating system versions. Um, I don't know if that means it won't work if you're not within that list, but um, reasonably, uh, what is the short version? Uh, iOS 13.2 or iPad OS 13.2, um, and anything newer than an iPhone or an iPad version six. I don't know how iPads are version. Sorry, uh, that's probably wrong. But an an iPhone 6s or 6s or whatever that the last one that everybody really 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 loved, um, the old one. Uh, but basically anything newer than that is fine as long as you can get the new version of um, either iOS or iPad OS on it. Uh, and then if you're doing servers that are Windows, for example, or desktop operating systems that are Windows, you're going to need to buy licensing for those. I'm not going to tell you anything about that other than to remind you that you have to go do that. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, third layer of the onion here, uh, software support. And this is where we get to... Uh, it's it's a little bit of a mixture between specifically FileMaker considerations like FileMaker Pro, like script steps or things that are supported on Go um, or supported between Pro and Server, for example, like those sorts of questions, things that, that, things that have changed there. Um, and uh, things that run within the operating system but outside of FileMaker. Um, one of the things that occurred to me actually, because I was trying to come up with this list for today. So I know... It's not everybody, but a, but there's a solid, I would call it a, a, a not insignificant minority <laughs> of uh, people who do scheduled scripts on server at, where those uh, scheduled scripts are not FileMaker scripts, they're operating system scripts. Uh, on Mac, they might be an Apple script. On uh, Windows, maybe it's a either a PowerShell or some kind of batch script thing that happens or uh, perhaps some other uh, scripting system that you trigger and then you know give an appropriate return back to FileMaker or whatever. Um, so those things all have to be checked when you do the upgrade. Um, I can't really help you or tell you how to do that, uh, except to say, make sure you do that because if you don't, your process may break. Um, especially if whatever that system is that you're using that's outside of FileMaker um, has changed or support has changed or honestly, some of those things, like they're not even around anymore. People stop developing it, so it may not run on the new operating system. So you have to go rebuild, uh, you know, rebuild that functionality in your app or consider how to build it differently um, going forward. So there's things like that that are, you know, they're, they're FileMaker, but they're not, um, you know, like Apple script changes or something like that. Um, and then of course, FileMaker licensing uh, to get up to 19. So especially a lot of people that come to me that are on super old versions of FileMaker and are looking to jump up to 19 or something like that, it's because they bought a permanent license back in the day. Um, and so they've been, you know, they, they have version 12 or they have version 14 and that's just what they're setting on. Um, that's fine, but just know that uh, a couple things. Uh, if you remember the incredible complexity of the FileMaker licensing program, um, basically previous to about two or three years ago, uh, that all has been mostly cleaned up. So um, there are situations in which you can kind of order off of the menu as far as licensing goes. If you're, you know, a, a large account with Claris, they'll they'll let some of those people kind of just keep renewing in, in perpetuity for their licensing stuff. Um, but a lot of people are basically going to end up on the new licensing programs, which are much simpler. Uh, there's annual licenses, just the most shortest version of this is there's annual licenses, there are concurrent licenses, and there are permanent licenses. Um, at this point, uh, all of, so unless you buy like a permanent FileMaker Pro specifically license, um, 
everything else is basically going to cover all uses of the software at this point. So uh, user licenses, which is what we sell most of, uh, it's like a yearly subscription, um, but it uh, it's it's an all-in-one. So you get like three servers, uh, you get however many seats of Pro, Go, WebDirect, you know, it's one number basically. I'm gonna buy ten seats. Okay, cool. So I can I can uh, log ten people into my database at a time. Fantastic. Um, user licenses particularly are meant for uh, internal uh, basically use. So um, you could like the, the theory is you could name each of the individuals that are associated with each seat. Um, it's a little complicated for super tiny shops, especially because they're always complaining to me that they can only get five seats, uh, but that's just the minimum in the licensing. Sorry, that's how that works. Um, but for other situations, for example, a concurrent license may make sense, um, which uh, they don't care who's connected, how they're connected, you know, et cetera. Um, concurrent licensure is like, we don't care who it is. Uh, you know, you buy a 10 seat concurrent, cool. Any 10, all day, no problem doesn't care what 10 could be data API could be web direct could be pro go what you know whatever it doesn't matter um, doesn't matter who it is whether they work for the company any of that stuff um, those are a little more expensive uh, for that reason uh, and then the third option is permanent licensure which is uh, actually really hasn't changed at all um, you buy it you get any versions that are released they call it maintenance but you get any versions that are released the year after you made the purchase so you don't feel bad when you buy 19.3 or 19.2 and then 20 subsequently comes out and you're like oh man i missed whatever uh well if it's within the year after you purchased you're good um, if you want to buy additional years of maintenance which will you know entitle you to those future versions of software released during those time periods cool um but you know you're not required to basically um and then yeah, perpetual license. Thank you if I uh, did not speak that clearly enough. Um, so let's get into some of the the real kind of actually within the within the actual FileMaker bubble. It's the the middle of the onion, if you will, one of the in, or maybe one of the inner layers. <laughs> I guess maybe the the middle of the onion is the, is the script steps or something like that. Um, so uh, if you're gonna jump up. Uh, We'll just take an example because that came across my desk recently. We'll say that you're on 12. You're on FileMaker 12. Um, you, you know you're 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 going to replace all those computers. You're getting a new server. You're going to do all that stuff. We're going to go straight to 19. You know, no intermediaries. We're going to throw the whole thing out. Okay. So con things that you want to check for. So for starters, uh, if you have plugins in either FileMaker Pro or on the server. Um, Basically, if it's if it's all the way back from 12, uh, you'll need definitely. Uh, I mean, obviously, you'll need an updated version of the plugin. You're probably going to need to go and inspect. Um, so you, you'll, you know, do the new install, set everything up, bring over the solution, do all that stuff, set 19 up, um, and then you're going to install those plugins either into the server or the client at that time. And then you need to sit there and probably in Pro 19 and go through and check everything that uses those plugins um, because it is highly likely something has changed. Um, in fact, it's almost guaranteed. Uh, and so, you know, things might things might either work differently. Some of the, um, I know, for example, was it base elements or 360 works email? Uh, one of the recent versions, uh, a recent, a year ago, I think, um, renamed a bunch of the, the script steps that are built in to that plugin or that are provided by that plugin um, to make them make more sense but like they renamed all the commands so you have to go through and find though if you have those command you know those script steps in your solution you have to go through and uh, basically update them all and so like repick it and set the stuff up again so um, there's that kind of stuff you'll have to do that for any client side stuff any server side plugins um, if you have I forget I think there's certain plugins that can run on go even uh, maybe I'm mistaken about that but just uh, just everything you want to make sure that you've checked all of that stuff so that that's the big one that's number one um, number two if you have uh, ODBC generally um, which could be either ODBC like you're using um, FileMaker, your FileMaker database is a data source, or uh, what's called ESS, which is where you're, for example, uh, pulling data out of MySQL or something, vacuuming that into a, a 
uh, an ESS table inside of FileMaker, either on pro or server, um, you're going to need to check all that stuff out end to end. So, for example, um, the ODBC drivers have been updated. Those have different, you know, support numbers and supported software versions and all that kind of stuff. So you have to check that. Um, and if that's on the client or the server, great. If there are third parties that have ODBC drivers installed because they were talking to an old FileMaker server, and so their driver version is old uh, for that old version of server, they're going to have to do stuff. Um, if you have, uh, what would you even say? Oh, so another good one. So if you, uh, if you had kept everything on ice, so you had something really old, um, and uh, that old, the external SQL database, for example, uh, is an old version. You may have to upgrade that as well, depending. Um, uh, it may be a good time to do it, or you want to just do it anyway because it's super old and you should update everything. That's great. But you should also actually check that because um, it may be that the drivers that you're using for the ODBC connections there uh, either don't support that ancient version of the software anymore or you know something like that or or whatever like you have to you have to go in check all that stuff and test it um oh good uh good call richard says plugins do not fundamentally run on go cool um so you end up putting it basically running the routine on server that makes sense um doing a doing a perform script and then process the data that way okay cool that's my bad um doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, MVS can run on Go. Yeah, there's a couple of them. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, I see. It's inside the iOS app SDK, which um, the short version with that is uh, you can do it if you have the checks to uh, write for people to get that whole kind of software publishing pipeline set up and get the little certificates and all the little bits that you need. Um, it's not a, it's not a fundamentally free or easy thing necessarily. Um, so, okay, that's good to know, actually. Uh, a small uh, <laughs> weakness in my knowledge here. That's fine. Um, so we covered uh, plugins. We covered ODBC. Um, another big one, and this is just something that has literally died. It's no longer there. Uh, instant web publishing. It's it's you know if you have a whole thing built uh, using that, uh, it's not in the product anymore. So um, you're going to have to consider where that. You know where that goes if that gets re-implemented. Um, if you're taking, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if it's 100% like a one-to-one -one match for that. But um, if you're if you're bringing stuff up, uh, there's there's also like kind of related considerations. So if you're using like old versions of the web presentation engine, uh, or as they I guess previously called it, either X, either the XML API uh, directly or a PHP API. Um, there's a couple things that you'll need to do there. So if you're using the XML API, that stuff actually may continue to work. Um, but as always, whatever that code is, if it's PHP, for example, um, it's going to be running inside of a new version of PHP uh, runtime or whatever. Um, they've changed a lot since then. Uh, you're going to need to run your code through the ringer to make sure it still works. Um, it may not. You may need to fix it. So that's a thing. Um, second, if you uh, built it with you know pretty decent code, but uh, you know you're using the FileMaker or the Claris uh, published PHP API library as they call it, um, you may want to you know if you're not going to rewrite the thing, uh, you may want to swap it out for the Airmoy. Uh, library, which is available on GitHub. Uh, it is basically the same thing. Um, it is almost exactly identical, uh, but it runs really well in new versions of PHP, and it runs much faster. Um, and so you can do a few changes here and there to your code and get some really excellent performance gains. Um, it is also worth noting, because I always have to talk about this, uh, FileMaker Server 19.2 for Windows um, and Linux. I think the Linux one doesn't come with it either. Uh, do not come with PHP at all anymore. So um, if you're on Mac, you can keep going. That's great. Um, there's some trade-offs there, but we don't need to talk about that necessarily right now. Um, but the short version is, if you're going to upgrade, if you're you know if you're doing hosting on Windows, uh, you're not going to have PHP afterwards. So you either need to prepare that or be prepared to install your own PHP. Um, there's honestly, I actually follow the guide from Microsoft when I do that. So <laughs> they, there's one on there. Uh, TechNet or whatever it's called now, um, the, the Microsoft documentation stuff. So there's that. Um, if you're like, cool, I want instant web publishing and I need to do something else, uh, I'm just going to tell you to use the data API at this point. Um, if you want to use our library, that's cool, but I don't really, you know, <laughs> use it or not. Like, the, I don't make any money off of it, so it's fine. Um, 
Although if you find any issues or uh, want to implement cool features, please uh, file issues or send me pull requests. They are welcome. Um, and then, yeah, uh, basically, so if you're doing web connectivity to FileMaker at this point, um, generally I'm going to recommend uh, the data API because that is what Claris is encouraging us. Also, um, we are at the point where performance of the data API, I, I haven't I haven't gotten a chance to actually sit and test. I think performance of the data API actually exceeds um, the XML API. Uh, their, what's interesting is their tested numbers uh, you know, show lower. So the web, the WPE or the XML API, basically that process on the server is certified for like up to 500 connections at a time. Um, and then they have over on the same chart that the data API is only good for a hundred. Um, but I have questions about that 100 number because in 19, they introduced a concept where there's a group of data API processes and it will spin up extra ones basically if it gets overloaded or if there's too many things going on at the same time basically. Um, and so, and it'll it'll spin up new ones as it needs them, and then as it you know as, if the load comes back down again, it'll it'll get rid of the ones it doesn't need or something like that. Um, uh, and that's very cool, but that that makes me think that a hundred is probably a very low uh, a very low number for what it can actually do. So um, that's a thing to know. Let's see what was the old retired technology before? Oh, CDML. Yeah. So if you come all the way up from CDML, I don't even know. If that's completely retired, then I think you're talking about a rewrite. So, um, just checking questions over here on Discord. Let's see. Ooh, Ruben has a good question. Um, all right. So, do 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 do. do. So, uh, Ruben's question is, how about the paths of documents stored in containers on server, uh, you know, basically when migrating to a new version? What, do we have to do anything? Do we have to move them? What, you know, what, what? So, um, there's going to be two things that go with that. So, if you're, if, if these are just regular containers, um, hit the example that Ruben is giving is like from 16 to 19, basically. Uh, the short answer is no, you're not going to see any changes. Uh, the longer answer is there may be changes, but I don't, I, I don't think you're going to see them. Uh, however, so it's, there's a thing worth noting, the FileMaker Server 19.2 installer theoretically, and I'm going to say theoretically, can upgrade all the way from a FileMaker Server 16. Uh, I don't actually recommend doing it. I haven't done one of those yet. Uh, someday I will get a customer that would be happy to uh, have me subject them to that, basically. Um, but we're not we're not there yet. Uh, mostly because a lot of the 16 servers ended up on 2012 R2, um, Windows Server 2012 R2, which uh, FileMaker Server 19 does not support. Um, for Macs, uh, it may be different. I haven't tried any of the upgrader stuff on Macs um, because historically it didn't work at all. Uh, it works. The 19.2 works reasonably on Windows. The the upgrade between major versions. I've done it from both 17 and 18 to 19.2. Those seem to work okay. Uh, I am nervous about going farther back than that, though Claris promises it works. Um, I, I would need to test that and see, you know, on, on a proper customer system that's been sitting there for how many years um, to really verify that and to double check that they're, um, they're in fact correct. There's also basically the farther back that you go in those versions trying to use that upgrade process, uh, the more kind of qualifiers there are and what you can do. Um, for example, just, just as a really easy example, um, FileMaker Server 16 had uh, two different additional database directories, um, whereas 17 and forward only have one. So if you had two of them, you're going to lose the second one. So if you have databases in those locations or, you know, you're using it to, to have like a big old, you've got like a billion drives and like one's got certain database and another's got the, you know, additional database one or additional database folder one and the additional container data location one, you know, you've got those split out and then you're doing another thing where you've got a database two and a container data two somewhere else. Um, you'll, you know, in air quotes, you'll lose your database. They'll still be sitting on your disk, obviously, but um, you'll need to figure out how to integrate those differently, um, like physically on disk, because they need to go somewhere else. Um, there's features like that that don't come up. There's uh, groups, which used to be a thing that you could set up in the uh, the admin console as far as certain groups of users that were kind of co collected between files or, um, you know, ha had Mac 
like OS login properties or something. I've seen some people do some interesting stuff with that. Uh, that stuff basically isn't supported anymore. It, it was stripped. Um, the Windows, the thing where you do Active Directory and you assign people to like the FileMaker group, that stuff still all works. Um, but this, this this group's thing was like a separate thing that was wholly within the admin console. Um, and it's just gone because I think about four people used it or something. Um, so let's see. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, sh the short version on container upgrades is no, nothing's, nothing really is going to change. Um, i trying to think if there's anything that I can even think of that would change there, not between 16 and 19. If you go farther than that, maybe. Um, but if you go too much farther than that, you're... Uh, oh, that's a good one, actually. So containers is a good topic. I didn't think about that. That should be... Let me put that on my list. So... Containers. So uh, a good one to talk about with containers is because uh, containers didn't exist previous to a certain version of FileMaker. The, the native ones didn't anyway. And so a lot of people use 360 Work Super Container. Um, so you can bring those. Uh, there's a script, basically, and it, uh, from your perspective, it's a big loop. Um, and it will take the 360 Work Super Container data, put it into a native container, um, and you basically just have to loop through the whole table and get that done. Um, if you want to upgrade, you're welcome, you know, basically you're welcome to do that and then use the native containers. Um, but Super Container is still supported by 360 Works, so if you want to continue doing that, that's fine. Uh, you're going to need to upgrade that. Uh, it's, a, it's not a plug-in per se, I guess, but kind of. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like a plugin. Uh, basically, it's a plug Anyway, so, but but Super Container has its own version of operating system support and all that, so, so you'd have to bring that stuff up or convert them to native containers if you were going to decide to do that upgrade path as well. Um, RCC has mostly done that, I think, for our internal systems. I don't think we have any Super Container remaining, but we, use, we used it extensively previously, so... Um, all right, I've got some comments. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Uh, Moki asked a good question over here. So bringing the containers internal uh, and then basically externalizing them again after the migration. I... Yes, you can do that. Uh, I'm trying to think of what, what the upsides to that would be. Mostly I do the opposite because there's a lot of um, a lot of our clients have used FMSP and at least by default all the containers are stored internally and so when we move them to like an Amazon server or something like that we spit the con like I was that's why I've done this the, the instruct the instructables video no the whatever we've done a live stream on it where how to split the container data out into its own directory and then use the additional database directory stuff on FileMaker server to to make that the cost scale a lot better um, um, and so I actually during up you know during migrations like that I end up actually doing the opposite I end up uh, usually taking the container data and putting it outside of the file. Um, I can see some maintenance benefits though of doing that. Probably though that would be like the time where you before you do the import or any of that stuff um, or you know bring it internally. You could like do uh, you know do a recover, save as compacted copy, like that kind of stuff. Um, those are good ideas. Um, yeah, I don't know that I'd bring it out and bring it back in again. I'm sure there's not there's a there might be a good reason to do that. I don't know what it is, but let's see. Do, 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 something about Docker. Thank you. Yes, you guys can explain what that is. Um, no, Ubuntu does not require Docker. Docker is something that can run in addition to Ubuntu or on Ubuntu. I think it can actually run on Windows and stuff as well. But um, it is a you can think of like a whole totally virtual computer, um, and it's and then a, an actual physical computer which is wholly real, and then a wholly virtual one, and it's like a little bit in between. So it let it, it lets you sit on top of a physical computer, but it but the stuff that runs inside of this little box has its own virtual environment. Basically, um, it's like a really light version of a virtual machine. Um, and so you can, there's certain things where you can like share certain bits with the underlying operating system. So for example, if you're going to run FileMaker server on Ubuntu, if you did an Ubuntu 18.04 machine and you wanted to run a Docker container on top of that, that had FileMaker server inside the box. Uh, I'm told that that's somewhat difficult and there's some tricks to get that done, but just for the basis of the example, FileMaker server would have a virtual environment. It would think it's running in Ubuntu 18.04 because it kind of is, but it's, it's wholly contained within its own little uh, bubble. 
Um, and so it can't touch anything outside of that Docker container. So um, that's useful for security, um, but also like I mentioned for performance reasons, Docker can, uh, you let Docker do the part where it has to scale across all the different processor cores rather than having FileMaker Server, which doesn't really do that, do it, so. Do you want oh, to, uh, yeah, maybe shut off and turn back on? Sure. Um, we're gonna cancel, turn my video. Thank you for calling that. Video is now frozen. Thank you, Ms. Net Lobster. Uh, all right, so we'll try and turn it back on. Let's see where it goes. Do, do, do. There, there, I'm there in, we go. In the corner. Awesome. So, um, what else is there? Yeah, we got that. Do, do something about giant databases. Cool. All right, video is good. Um, all right, and then, yeah. So, um, that's actually a good point. I kind of mentioned that um, another good thing to do if you're doing a big upgrade, if you're if you're if you're totally within, like you're not doing a file format change at all. You're totally, you know, you're you you're on 12, for example, and you're going or 12 or newer, and you're going to 19. Um, it's a good time to take the new version of FileMaker Pro, like when you migrate. Uh, do the like save a compacted copy, run a recover on the file, that kind of like kind of occasional maintenance. Um, a lot of our customers don't really do that kind of stuff on any real schedule. Um, I don't know if we have like an official recommendation to do that, but basically I occasionally tell people to do that um, because several of our senior engineers recommend it. They recommend like running a recover, saving a compacted copy on a schedule of some sort. Um, but if you haven't ever done that, uh, then it's just, it's an excellent, um, just excuse basically to do that. And you may save yourself some space actually, um, cause a lot, a lot of times there's a lot of bloat inside of the files. And so you'll get something that's actually quite a bit, um, smaller on disk. Okay. We can, yeah, you can imagine that I'm moving. Sorry. I think my, uh, super HD video is like causing the <laughs> I don't know how to adjust my camera to not be 1080p. <laughs> uh, yeah, you get rid of bloat by saving a compacted copy. Um, also, by not storing container data inside of the FMP12, um, I specific, I, I'm probably the only one who does. I very specifically recommend storing container data outside of the database. There's totally good reasons to store it inside. It's, you know, it's not that both of them are fine, basically. Um, but I recommend storing it outside of the database because you're um, basically there's a there's thirty or thirty five percent overhead um, on the like of the file size. So if you have a three megabyte image, it'll be four when you store it inside of the file um, ballpark of so ballpark of four megabytes so if you think about that times how many images documents whatever you're storing um, if you have a lot of records or a lot of files that can add up very greatly uh, I did a migration at the end of last week um, and and it was just a, a FileMaker cloud one or yes uh, I do mean file size so um, I did a migration last week on Friday. Uh, we took somebody from FileMaker Cloud One and they had a giant flat file, it was 36 gigabytes. Um, I, uh, I didn't even actually run the compacted copy, to be honest. Uh, all we did was take all of the containers inside the file and put them outside of the file. We uh, changed it to external secure. Um, so they ended up with uh, just shy of 22 gigabytes of actual external container data and a 300 megabyte database, um, which is how big their record data actually was. So we went from uh, 36 gigs total data set size to 22. Um, so you'll, that's, that's, uh, I thought it was actually going to be bigger afterwards because it's, it's usually my expectation for 36 gigs would be somewhere in the range of 26, 28 total, you know, after, after, after export file size. Um, and so they, they had uh, a little extra fluff in the file, if you will. Um, and so I recommend that actually. So, but one of the reasons for that is because it lets us do much quicker backups. Um, if you do a split container setup because you're storing lots of documents, which I recommend, uh, or I recommend a split container setup in the situation which you're storing lots of documents. The reason for that is because usually those companies' data, the actual record data size is quite small. Uh, in this example, right, 300 megabytes or so. Um, but um, this other one that I'm working on, uh, somebody had a 180 gigabyte database and 
uh, and, a, and a respectable 70 gigabytes of um, container data uh, attached to that file. Uh, it, ter it just turns out one of the tables uh, is like massive for some reason. We're still trying to figure out why, but one that one table that did have some container data in it, uh, if you nuke the whole thing out, it brings the database from 183 gigs to about 11. <laughs> so, um, you can get some very significant size savings sometimes. Depends. There's other. We I think there might be a solution issue with that one, and so we're I'm working to figure that one out. But um, that's it's a consideration for sure um, when you're doing upgrades. So, um, question: Why does FMS say when you're using a 30 gig hard drive, but your FMP files are like 500 megabytes total? Because FileMaker Server has to tell you the total minimum requirements, which are not 500 megabytes. Uh, you have at least a gig for the software for each of them. Uh, for FileMaker Server, a gig, and FileMaker Pro, if that's installed, it's another gig. Uh, maybe less than a gig, but we'll round up and say it's a gig, gigabyte of data. Uh, and then you have the operating system because uh, if they don't list something like 30 gigs as the minimum size, um, people will try and be smart, uh, smart like smart Alex, and uh, oh, you know, they only said we need a gigabyte of space, so if I have a one gigabyte hard drive, that's enough to, no, it's not, don't, don't, don't do that. Um, they, they have to, they have to put requirements like that for people who are trying to find uh, ways to be cheap in in a, a manner that's just silly, um, and so uh, for example, we don't need, like I like I mentioned, we've done this in previous streams. I don't put the databases on the boot drive generally unless it's an on-site Mac or something like that. Um, but uh, but even still, uh, just the Windows boot drive on our cloud servers, they're uh, either 50 or 60 gigabytes currently. Um, and that only has the FileMaker server software on it, no databases. So it's the operating system and all the stuff that goes with that and the, the FileMaker server software. Um, the other thing to note though is uh, actually 30 is a really, really low number. Um, and the reason it's a really, really low number is because there are caches associated with FileMaker server, like cached, like saved uh, copies of data, intermediate data, data that hasn't been integrated yet, whatever on the server side. Um, and those can be quite large. Uh, like quite large um, and so undersizing stuff is a serious issue um, the other so that's one thing so that's like regular caches the other one is um, if you do lots with uh, container data temp files build up on the boot drive um, and so you either want to uh, have a schedule that clean those cleans those out or reboot the machine or something uh, on a schedule on Windows you can like build a you can use the little temp cleaner thing that comes built into Windows and you can schedule that. Uh, on Mac, I actually don't know what to do, but I think Unix and, and similar things will handle temp directory data more uh, intelligently, which is if the disk is full, um, it will nuke everything in the temp directory in, a, in an emergency attempt to save itself, which may sort of automatically save you. Um, I wouldn't rely, I wouldn't rely on that, but um, but I think there's, a, but that it's a difference in how those are handled. Uh, temp files that Windows thinks are owned won't be automatically cleaned, and so you can like literally, basically fill your boot disk and knock your server over on accident. So, um, do to do. Uh, Moki. So uh, Moki and Discord posted a. Uh, screenshot of his uh, volume, the thing from the landing page on the FileMaker server admin console, or maybe the cloud one, because they're they they look the same. Um, and it says uh, space used some uh, percent, and it's 38 percent. It says total space 50 gigabytes, space used 18.8 gigabytes, space remaining 31.2 gigabytes. And he's like, well, I meant this. Why am I using 18 gigabytes? Because my databases are you know half a gig or something like that, half a you know 500 megabytes or so. Uh, the reason for that is it is is accounting for the total space used on that disk. So uh, that will always be, well, the total space used on that disk. So if you have an operating system installed, you need to account for that. Um, that uh, doohickey on the admin console is not going to give you good information in uh, basically any scenario unless you put, um, it'll, it'll do the correct thing on FileMaker Cloud because the database directory is on its own hard drive, if you will, a virtual drive. Um, so that one works correctly. And if you did something similar on a, a different virtual server or um, 
what do you call that? Like an on-site server, uh, like where I mentioned, you know, if you put like the if you put FileMaker server on a um, a database drive, and then the databases are in the FileMaker server directory, like you have your you have your C drive that you boot. I'm just going to use Windows as the example. Um, you have your C drive that you boot from. It's got Windows and stuff on it, but it doesn't have FileMaker Server. You go and install FileMaker Server on your D drive. That'll be your data drive. Why not? Um, so then you have FileMaker Server installed on your D drive. You put your databases in that directory. So then the only um, data that it will be counting is is databases plus maybe the, the however big FileMaker Server is, which, like I said, is about a gig. Um, and that'll give you a much better reading. Uh, realistically, I, I have kind of frustrations with those uh, charts and stuff that they put on the, the dashboard of the FileMaker server admin console, because in most customer scenarios that I deal with, they're basically wrong. Um, the CPU and network stuff is fine. Um, and the memory as well, those are okay, because those are, it's a, you know, it's like a global resource. You, if you read any number, you'll get the right one, it's fine. Um, but FileMaker server for disk space specifically will read from like the drive that FileMaker server is installed on, which may not be, that may not have any relevance to your actual running system, so. Um, uh, Moki, no, you should avoid um, undersizing the disk. Don't do that. I mean, you can if you want to make your own decisions, but if your server blows up, I will not be responsible for it, is the short version, because um, you could run yourself out of space um, fairly easily if you try and size the, the disks too close to your total data set size. Um, for databases, we multiply the disk. You guys know we do the split. Um, we multiply the like the total size of the FMP12s. So in Moki's example, they're 500 megabytes. Um, we multiply those by three uh, to make sure that there that there's enough space because you need at least room for an additional copy of the databases. 500 megabytes, you know, that's a rounding error. Nobody cares. But if your databases are larger than that, uh, you know, you have gigabytes, tens of gigabytes, potentially hundreds of gigabytes um, of FMP12 data. Uh, you're going to have challenges if you don't have if that drive is not a multiple some multiple, two or three, potentially more um, of the database size. So when you go to do a restoration, you're gonna have a bad time uh, if any kind of a crash happens. Um, the other thing is, is that, right, the data set grows over time. And so you can also run, if you don't do a multiple, you can run into a situation where no crash happens actually, but you fill your disk. Um, that's also bad, don't do that. Windows and FileMaker server do not like that at all. Um, Okay, what are the, uh, I guess our final, th there's there's about two final things to cover today um, as far as the, the upgrade questions actually, and then we'll, we'll uh, what say wrap this up, land the plane. Um, so within FileMaker Pro particularly, um, I mentioned this earlier with regards to the plugins where, yeah, if you're jumping like seven versions, you're gonna have new plugins, they're gonna have new script steps. This, if you're jumping seven versions, the same thing applies to FileMaker Pro. Um, I can even give a really easy example. Uh, a big change that happened, um, was it, it was 14, 15, 16 era, uh, is the insert from URL script step. Uh, that existed through that t that entire time period, but it has changed significantly. It has grown in c capability, actually. Um, and so you want to go back and look and confirm that any processes that use stuff like that still work. Um, one of the weird ones, actually, uh, especially if you are going all the way to 19 the first time, um, if you have, uh, and actually RCC ran into this, if you have something like a robot, which will, uh, it's a you know it's a FileMaker database and what it does is it links into other FileMaker databases to run scripts. Um, this is often done by uh, basically a fancy call of fm insert from URL and then there's a, a little parameter thing where you can like launch a script inside of this other file. Um, so that works the same basically and if you upgrade that will I'm just going to call it continue to work. I guess maybe my video will show the the, the air quotes I'm doing here. Um, so that. There we go, perfect. So that will continue to work. Um, but uh, one of the things that has changed is um, the order that the scripts are run in when you launch into that third file. Um, and, th and so if you have your thing set up where there's a bunch of checks all over the place, for example, to close out the windows so that you don't end up with ghost 
uh, you know, database connections or something like that, which is very important on a on a robot or something like that, because you'll end up out of RAM and all kinds of cra you know funky issues can happen. Especially if you're like logging into a file with different credentials to go do different for particular tasks or something like that. Um, basically the order that those things are run in has changed and so um, we ran into issues where certain things were being run first uh, and in our files those things were the things that closed the windows and so we uh, tried to upgrade to 19 and uh, ran into this fantastic issue where uh, the robot script would go log into the third file and it it appeared to complete immediately um, which is amazing you know wouldn't you love to upgrade to 19 and have a process that used to take 15 minutes uh, you know finish in three seconds that would be fantastic um, what you know what an upgrade I, I would be shouting it from the rooftops everybody should upgrade what what was actually happening is it was running the script that we had set up inside uh, that, that did the final close windows it was running them before the actual script that did the work ran um, and so you have to be careful for uh, that's just that's like one example but it's a really good example of how it'll totally blow up something um, where you've got something that has you know functionally it works the same uh, you know you can still fire scripts across files like that no no problem but uh, you know something about that system has changed since then and so you need to go think about that again so if you're doing big upgrades like that you're gonna need to step through all of the hot points in your solution, the stuff that's used all the time, um, and make sure all of those things still work, basically. So, um, and then, and that's, like I said, that's kind of the same point as I made with the with the plugins, but a little bit different, because it's, right, third-party code, that's kind of, it's a little more obvious. Um, you know, I have to upgrade this thing, it's like 10 years out of date or whatever, okay, uh, like, duh. Um, and you, but you might expect that things would just totally remain static inside of FileMaker. I'm just going to tell you, uh, they have not, thankfully, actually wonderfully, um, we like that, but <laughs> it means there's work associated. So, um, mm -mm -mm -mm. let me think. I'm trying to think of like considerations for server that we need to deal with. We did all that. We did the plugins. We did ODBC. We did all the web stuff. Um, I could talk for like two minutes, two seconds about web direct. I don't think that that matters so much. Looks like my video might be paused again. Yeah, I think it froze. At what percent of memory usage should you increase your RAM? Um, that is, uh, that's a good question. I would also say that it's a little bit backwards. Um, and the reason that I say that it's backwards is, I mean, backwards like it's putting the cart before the horse. Um, oh, and then I try and set it up and it's black video again. Um, so what I, what I would say is you want to think more broadly. So uh, as I, I got, you know, poked with the stick by one of the other consultancies for saying, oh, yeah, just, you know, put the RAM cache at half. So realistically, if you do that, uh, you'll be fine. Um, if, you're, if you're having memory problems, like there's not enough, uh, then you need to increase it. Um, we, and this makes some of our customers, I'll just say, slightly nervous sometimes because they go look at that admin console and they're, you know, they have constant notifications because FileMaker server will fire a, it's not like an email notification, but it is still a notification. Um, let's try the video here. Awesome. That looks like it's going to go. Perfect. So, um, and so it will tell you, it'll send a little kind of error notification um, on the admin console if you have over 80% RAM used. Um, our smaller machines basically idle at about 85. Uh, that's quite full. Um, it's true. Uh, but people don't log into those servers. They're not doing much on them. Uh, it is server side processes. Uh, if that makes you uncomfortable, then you need to either reduce the RAM cache or install more RAM, whichever. Um, as you go up in RAM amount, so, you know, start, you know, these, it's these silly little four gigabyte boxes, they don't, you know, they basically don't have that much, uh, uh memory in them. Okay. You know, so you get to eight, so once you get to eight, you'll start seeing 70 or low 80s as how full it is. If you're up at 12, 16, 32 gigs of RAM on the server um, or more, uh, those percentages will be less. Um, and it's just because with the, the volume of RAM, so if you have 32 gigs of RAM and Windows uses a gig or two or something, and then you've got half of it used by FileMaker server and some additional like the accoutrement processes uh, WebDirect and data API and, and web presentation engine XML API 
API if you've got that stuff turned on. Um, like, you know, there's other stuff running that'll use some of the RAM, uh, but you still, you know, may not get above the 70s, 70%, something like that. Um, you know, mid 70s, something like that. And so you'll look at that and go, all right, cool. You know, I'm totally comfortable. So if you have scheduled script processes that run um, and you're not, you know, you're not basically having RAM issues with that, you're good. That's it. Um, if you're sitting there idling at 20, you know, 25% memory used on your FileMaker server or something like that, frankly, you wasted the money on the extra RAM that you bought for that. Um, you should increase your cache size uh, so that you get some of that extra performance. If you have a tiny database, maybe it doesn't matter and you just overbought on the hardware, that's fine. Um, but you can still use it, basically. So, uh, you know, you bought it, you paid for it, it's still there. Um, I, I'm one of the, there's like a really old, like debate in computing about, you know, if you, you people try and have the minimum amount of RAM used because it's like cool and that used to be like a really difficult problem was, you know, um, the systems just didn't have that much RAM and so you had to be very, very circumspect with software and RAM usage and trying to find the most efficient one or whatever. Um, I come down on basically the other side of that debate, which is if you have memory and you're not using it, why did you pay for it? Um, that that may be controversial for certain people, but uh but but because memory is you know your active data working set, that just means if you have more memory, you can work with more data at once um, on the server side. And so uh, basically, that's good at all times. Um, and so yeah, uh, you know the problem is when you run out of RAM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the issue. Uh, so yeah, notification is over eighty percent correct. Um, that's the number, and that's that's why I say for our for our smaller systems. And again, these are underspecified. I you know I don't recommend unless you're going to really learn how to run a FileMaker server and identify the solutions that you know they're not going to outstrip the RAM requirements or something like that. Um, I would I would start your FileMaker servers at eight gigs of RAM anyway. Um, that's the that's Claris's recommendation, and frankly, you'll just have a, a much better time in general anyway. Um, but some people want to save a penny, so. Um, we try and help them with that when possible. <laughs> um, open ticket. There's a good question. Do to do to do to do. Already upgraded. I like it. Yep. All right. Cool. Uh, yes. Plane landing time. I think we covered almost everything. There was only one other thing. We'll land the plane. The only other thing is. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll not cover it in any detail. I'll just say it so it's really quick so you guys are aware. Um, if you are coming up from a super old version of FileMaker, which is right at the topic of today, uh, often those solutions will have classic mode layouts. Um, that's fine. Uh, think very carefully about that. Uh, I will only say that classic mode layouts in new versions of FileMaker are uh, quite slow in general and sometimes unusably slow. Um, the reason for that is because the way, the when they did conversions from the seven file format to the 12 file format, it just took all the styling and put it directly into the layout. Um, that's this, you know, that's why we talk about theming, uh, making a unified theme to speed up a FileMaker file. It's basically the opposite of that. Um, it's it's there is no there is no real theme, if you will. Uh, everything is each individual object is styled. Um, that's horrifying for from FileMaker's perspective, and so. Uh, for some solutions, it doesn't really matter because it's simple enough, but if you have a lot going on on screen, it can be slow for no like strictly obvious reason. See if that's what it is. The quick way is you, re you rebuild that layout after the upgrade in one of the default, the new default themes um, and see if it's still slow. If it's not, you found your problem. Yeah, and then um, the couch, please. So that's it. So uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up from here. Uh, thank you all for attending as always. Uh, you can go check out our stuff on the live tab of FM Training TV to find out when new new one new uh, live streams are going to be happening. Um, you can also, uh, if you have any follow up questions, yep, thank you, uh, Miles, for putting that on screen. Um, if you have any follow up questions, uh, either shoot an email to me or send one to support at rcconsulting.com. Um, we'd be more than happy to help you. Uh, and if you address it to me, they'll probably put my name on it and let me know. So, uh, thank you all. Have a great. Uh, it's Friday, so have an excellent weekend. Cool. Thanks, thanks. Mm -hmm.
guys just stepped up the whole way. Calm, cool, collected the quarterback. Great read, good patience. More importantly, great job up front protecting this quarterback to give you a chance. And that's all you can ask for. Trying to rally down 10. 9.25 to go here in the fourth. Short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot, goes snap. Stands in, throws it left for Amendola. Reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10. Rolling to the 9. Oh. Slightly behind him. Again, he makes the grab.